All right, now I will share screen. <clears throat> okay, folks. Um, um, let's see. So uh, I'll just start, I guess. I'll write some. Uh, it's about 1040. Um, so uh, today, the plan is to discuss. Um, Make sure that this right. Um, systems of two electrons and um, we'll be introducing time independent perturbation theory, which is an important new topic. So that's the plan for today. Um, <clears throat> and um, okay, so let's let's get going with it. Um, so the thing is, um, let's just sort of s spend a moment remembering what we did last time, where last time we were talking about um, addition of of spin angular momentum. <clears throat> so this is a review, a little bit of review of last time. <clears throat> and so what we did was we were talking about how uh, for addition of spin, we can, uh, I already know what somebody suggested that I do. Okay, um, we, uh, the, the last time we were talking about how um, addition of spin is simply the idea of taking the spin wave function a, a spin uh, many body wave function uh, and expressing it um, in terms of a different basis. And so the idea is that we will express that wave function in terms of the eigenstates of, of, a, of, of a new uh, operator. And so we will express it in terms of eigenstates of S1 plus S2 plus S3 and the operator uh, S1Z plus S2Z. Oops. Um, S2Z plus S3Z. Uh, and so we will uh, express we will express the spin state in terms of the eigenstates of these guys, uh, and the eigenstates are uh, now. Uh, I can write like this, S total, M total. And this represents the quantum number uh, for the eigenstate of the S total squared operator. And that represents the quantum number for the S total Z operator. Um, and whereas before, what we were expressing our uh, wave function, our spin wave function simply as product states. <clears throat> so before what we were doing is we would express our spin wave functions as eigenstates of these operators, S1 separately from S2, separate from S3, and S1Z separate from S2Z, separate from S3Z, et cetera. In which case our eigenstates before were written as um, uh, products of S1, M1, S2, M2, S3, M3, etc. Okay, so it's just a change of basis from one basis to the next. So I just want to emphasize that addition of spin or addition of any angle momentum is really just a change of basis from the from the basis of the eigenstates of one set of operators to the eigenstates of another set of operators, as you see here. It's, so that's that's the idea, and I, I think that idea is not always obvious. I mean, when I was taught 
when I was taught addition of angle momentum, no one ever told me that. I didn't figure it out until like 10 years later. Um, okay, um, and so then what we can do is we can write, um, we can then write our total angle momentum state in terms of um, the product states. So we can sum up M1 and M2. And so we just have to do a sum over these product states, S1, M1, uh, S2, M2. This is for um, adding, for adding any two spins, for adding two spins, S1 and S2, then we, we see in general, we can write the total thing momentum state as a sum over all the possible product states, but there's a restriction, a constraint, which is that M1 plus M2 equals M total. And these coefficients then um, are the important thing. And we have S1, S2, S total, and M1, M2, M total. And those coefficients are the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients. And, and we actually uh, we actually derived these klebsch gordon coefficients. We derived all of this for the example of two spins. Hey, somebody uh, is running their water should uh, mute themselves. Whoever's doing that, everyone can hear you. Um, so um, we did an example, which is we have S1 equals one, we have two spins, S1 and S2. And then um, what we, uh, well first before, actually let me, let me just remind you be, that one of the things that we discussed also before I jump into that is uh, when we have, when we add two spins, then we have a, then we have a general rule And the general rule is that if I have spin uh, S1 and spin S2, then the total spin can equal S1 plus S2 or S1 plus S2 minus one, S1 plus S2 minus two, et cetera, all the way down to the absolute magnitude of S1 minus S2. And those are all the possible total spin angle momentums. Um, and so that's that's a, a, a critical rule uh, for us to remember. And so then we can do the um, the, the special the case of two electrons. So this is a special case. It's a very common case. It happens a lot in nature. <clears throat> and so in this special case, we um, we have um, we we show that we have s one equals one half and S2 equals one half. And so then we see using this rule, we see that S total can equal one, that's S1 plus S2, and then we close down to zero, S1 minus S2. Um, and then for the S total equals one states, we have um, three of them. Uh, we have, um, the, uh, if I write this as one, one, that's S total, M total, then that's, I could write that as up, up, where that's, where now I'm talking, this is particle number one and particle number two. Uh, this is this is the new basis, and this is the old basis. See, this is a, this is a product state. Product state. And so, um, then for this state, we have M total equals one, but we also can write in the new basis, we have S total equals one, M total equals zero, which we figured out as one over square root of two. In the old basis, it's uh, up, down, plus, down, up. Those are the product states. Uh, and this is M total equals zero. 
me. So, where I have n total equals zero. And then the third one is uh, one minus one, which is equal to uh, down, down. This is, has m total equals minus one. Okay, and so those are the, we call these the, the triplet states because there's three. And then of course we have uh, S total equals zero. The singlet state because there's only one. And that is going to be S total equals zero, M total equals zero. And that is one over square root of two times in the old basis, up, down, uh, minus uh, down up uh, m total equals zero. Okay, so that's really just a review of of, of last time. Uh, I just took a few minutes to, to do that. Uh, and so one thing that we want to um, ask then is what is the symmetrization of of these states? The symmetry uh, in 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 part in terms of the exchange. What is the exchange symmetry of of these new um, total angular momentum states? And so let's just take a look at it. And so let's consider uh, s total equals one. And so let's hit that state. Let's hit the state of p. Um, Let's let's take the exchange operator, which exchange particle one and particle two, and let's hit this first state one one. And let's ask ourselves, was it equal? So if I so if I hit it, then that's the same as hitting the product state up up. And so where this is the state of particle number one and state of particle number two. And so now if I exchange those two particles, uh, what is the symmetry? What does the what is the new state? <laughs> Can someone tell me? Does anybody see that? It's the same state. Yeah, exactly. It's unchanged. So it's still up up. So that means that it has positive symmetry. Uh, and the symmetry is uh, I'll just say lambda equals plus one. Uh, but now I guess I'll try to box this off. Um, now do the same thing to this one, hit hit this one now with P with the one, two operator. And now just, I won't write it down, but just do it in your head, look at it. And can someone tell me what is the symmetry of the one, zero state? What is the symmetry under exchange of the, of the one, zero state? What happens? One, again? Yeah, because it's the same thing. Because if I, you see if I, if I swap them, then you get the same thing. See, if I swap these guys, and if I swap these guys, it all comes back to itself. And now look at the same thing. Now look at the one minus one. Look at what's the symmetry there. I want you to see that it's exactly the same. So the symmetry of the triplet states is plus one. They are symmetric. So we say that they, so we call them symmetric. Uh, but now let's let's take a look at the um, symmetry of the singlet. So now let's hit that p one two onto zero zero, and now then that means that I'm hitting um, p one two onto this state. And so then what is that equal? Can you see it? Negative one. Right, it comes to the negative of itself. And you can see that because I have this negative sign right there, that's what does it. So when I, when I swap those spins and exchange those particles, it comes, the, that state comes to its negative self. And so I call this state anti-symmetric. And that's really important because the, that, that's telling us that the singlet state, the singlet state of uh, the S total equals zero state of two spins, is anti-symmetric, whereas the triplet states are all symmetric. 
and that has important physical consequences. And let's look at a, let's look at a couple examples of that of those consequences. <clears throat> and the first example, the first consequence is let's consider uh, two electrons in a box. Two electrons in a box. That's always my favorite example, particle in a box, because I have um, I have the I have my box. I love boxes. I have my first state A, my second state B. I love this because it just has all the quantum mechanics is in that simple example. Um, and so now let's let's ask ourselves what is the ground state? What is the ground state? And this state has energy A, and this state has energy B. And so I have two electrons, and I want to find the ground state. So that means I have to take those two electrons and throw them into the box. And I have to throw one of them in one state and the other into another state, or the same state. Or so, so where do I put the two? So to find the ground state of this box, where do I put the two electrons? Somebody tell me. And the ground state, by definition, I should add, is the lowest energy state. One in A, one in B? Well, that makes a lot of sense to say that because we know that the wave function has to be symmetrized. And you, you know that if I only consider the spatial part, if I put them both into the same state, then um, I cannot, it cannot be anti-symmetric. So you have to put them into separate states by the Pauli exclusion principle. So that, so that what you said makes perfect sense, except now let's take into account spin. And so the total wave function is still anti-symmetric, but now the total wave function is the spatial part times the spin part. So we have more ways to uh, symmetrize the wave function. So I will ask that question again, where should I put those electrons for the lowest energy state? them both in in the state a <clears throat> exactly now i can do that i put there they are i put them both in there see little arrows for, for particle number one and particle number two um <clears throat> and oh actually i'm going to erase that because that is confusing it looks like spin uh just so that's exactly right and the re and but 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 now we know that if the two electrons are in the same state, the same spatial state, what then is the symmetry of the spatial wave function? It has to be what? <clears throat> what is the symmetry? Well, I'll ask a qu another question, a related question. Can it be anti-symmetric if they're both in the same state? Yes or no? What? No. That's right. It cannot be anti-symmetric. And so if both particles are in the same state, what is the symmetry of the spatial part of the wave function? Um, well, the spatial part has to be symmetric because the spin state is. That's right. It's just the spatial part is symmetric. It has to be symmetric because the spatial part of the wave function is this. It's psi A of x1, <clears throat> particle x1, and psi a of particle 2, x2. And so you can see that if I swap the labels 1 and 2, then uh, it comes back to itself. And so the symmetry is plus 1. <clears throat> OK, so if the symmetry is plus 1, then, then what, is this, what symmetry do I have for the spin wave function? What does it have to be? Negative 1. It has to be negative one. Perfect. That's exactly right. That way, the symmetry, um, then the total symmetry is equal to plus one times minus one equals minus one. That's right. So what then? So so this is my spatial wave function. If they're both in the same state, that has to be my, that's the only one available to me. Um, and so now I have to figure out the spin wave function. So I have two electrons. And I'm asking myself, what are all the possible spin states of two electrons? And I can write them as product states, but then they would not be 
I could not construct an anti-symmetric spin state from just simple product states and go do that on your own and, and find out for yourself that that's not possible. <clears throat> but now let's look at the total spin states of two electrons. And here they are, this, the three triplet and the singlet state. So which one of these states uh, does my ground state have to be in? <clears throat> Somebody yeah, state. yeah, exactly. <clears throat> it has to be the singlet. And you can see that because the singlet has uh, the symmetry is, is, neg is negative. Negative one. It has negative symmetry under particle exchange. <clears throat> so then that, so my spin state then has to be the singlet. It has to be. And so that means then that my total wave function is going to be um, the spatial part, which is symmetric, times the spin part, which is the uh, anti-symmetric spin part. All right, and so that's the <clears throat> so that's my wave function. Okay, and so so now let's let's consider and oh I I also want to add if you haven't thought about these singlet states very much where this is the singlet, then I do want to mention that this is an example of an entangled state and entanglement. An entangled state is really quite simple. It entangled just means that I cannot write it as a product state. It just means it's not a product state. That's, that's literally the definition of an entangled state. And the reason I mentioned entangled, entanglement is because when you talk about quantum information theory or quantum computers, the most important thing that allows quantum computation to occur is entanglement of quantum states. And this is really the first example of entanglement in, in this course. Uh, this is an entangled state. Because if I look at the singlet state, look at it, you can see that it cannot be written as a product. I cannot take a spin, uh, a state of spin one, uh, uh, I cannot take a, a spin state of particle one and a spin state of particle two and multiply them and get this state. It's, uh, it's, it's, an, it's so, and, and so as, as a result, it's an entangled state. Um, okay, so now let's consider another example, <clears throat> which is, uh, this is chemical bonding. <laughs> so let's consider the example of chemical bonding. And it's really just another box. To me, everything is a, every quantum stage is a little box. So let's consider a different kind of box. So let's consider a box which is comprised of two nuclei. And so here's one nuclei and here's the other. And so um, those are two nuclei, two like two protons. And then let's figure out, uh, let's consider what the possible wave functions are. And so this is a box. So if I put an electron, one electron into this box, he will be attracted to those two nuclei. And that's like a box, it's stuck. The electron will be stuck in there. And so that means that there's different um, states that are allowed, the ground state, the excited state, et cetera. And so let's look at them. And I'm not gonna solve the Schrodinger equation to get to drive these. We will actually do that later in this class, but let's consider the ground, the lowest energy state. Uh, I will call him Psi B, big B, because he looks like this. And so that big B stands for uh, bonding. And then the first excited state looks like that. And this is what the wave, the shape of the wave function. And this state I'll call psi AB, where that stands for um, antibonding. anti-bonding. So these are two states, and I'm not even going to derive them. We will derive them later in this class when we do degenerate perturbation theory, but let's just assume that they exist. They're just states. They're just the, the two nuclei are a box, and these are just like the, you know, the ground state and the first excited state of this particular box. Um, and so then I ask myself, then we can ask ourselves, 
um, what is what then is the ground state of this system? If, if, if I have two electrons. So let's throw two electrons into this box. I throw them in and I want to know what's the ground state. And so, and so let's write it here, psi total. So someone tell me what is the ground state? And, and so first, we, the, I'll, I'll, I'll give you a hint, it's gonna be the spatial part times the spin part. And so somebody first tell me what is the spatial part? What is this? What is the spatial part? So can someone tell me? And it's just like the example we did a moment ago. It's the same reasoning. So what's the spatial part of this, of the ground state of this system where I throw two electrons into this double nuclei box? It's like a symmetric wave function. That's a product state of the, the two grounds. Of which one, psi B or psi AB? Um, psi AB. Well, this one, look, that's the lowest energy one. That's the next highest energy one, right? That, that was the, that's how, what I meant it to be. So this is, uh, this axis is energy. And so first, I guess I should say, when I throw those two electrons into this box, where do they go? Oh, let, me, let me make that the, be the question. Where do the two electrons go? I have these two possible states, psi B and psi AB. Where do the two electrons go in the ground state? Psi anyone? B. Yeah, anyone can speak up. Uh, exactly, they both go there because that has the lowest energy. <clears throat> that has the lowest energy. And so I'll call that the bonding energy. Whereas this one has um, the antibonding energy. So I, maybe I should have written that before. So they both go in there. And so as a result, the, sp the total part of the, the, the spatial wave function for the two electrons is gonna be psi B of, now I'll call it R1 since it's a three dimensional object. That's, that's particle one times psi B of particle two, because this is the because the bonding state is a state of one electron state. It's a state for one electron, so that's the lowest energy for one electron. So it goes into that state, and the other electron goes into that state too, because that's the lowest energy state. So that's the ground state. But what about the spin part? What is the wave? What is the spin part of the wave function? Would it have to be the singlet state? Exactly, because this part is symmetric. And so it's a, it, it, the two electrons are indistinguishable fermions. So the many body wave function has to be anti-symmetric. <clears throat> so the spin part has to be the singlet. Up, down, minus, down, up. That's right. And so, um, and so that then is the, the wave function for a chemical bond. So that's the structure of all chemical bonds in the universe. All right, so now that's, so, so now you know chemistry. <laughs> and so that's, that's all of chemistry um, because, because now what happens is those two electrons are there and we see that the spin of a, of a chemical bond is zero. It's in a singlet state. The two electrons in a chemical bond are in a singlet state. Is the, that, that's the structure of a chemical bond. And so those two electrons are bonding those two nuclei together and they are in a, in a singlet state. And so another cute thing is that every chemical bond is entangled. So people, you know, people always talk about entanglement, but entanglement is actually a very common phenomenon. Every chemical bond in the universe is entangled. <laughs> They're all entangled. So you're made out of entangled states uh, because you're made up of chemical bonds. That's what holds you together. Um, okay, so that's kind of cute. Um, now let's consider the last example, 
before we move on. Uh, and the last example, of course, is helium. And so, um, <clears throat> so helium is just another box, just another box. Uh, and so now let's consider, um, so for helium, the box is a, is a single nuclei, but the Z is what? What, what is the Z for, for helium? Can someone tell me the Z? Remember what Z is? <laughs> Anybody two. remember? What? Two? Exactly, good, it's two. So there's two charges, two nuclei, or two protons in the nucleus of helium, it has Z equals two. Uh, and so now let's, that creates a box, and this is what the box looks like. It's a Coulomb potential, right? So when I draw this, I'm drawing um, V as a function of R. So it's a Coulomb potential, that's what I meant to draw, the Coulomb potential. And so you get uh, levels, you're gonna get you know, energy levels, right? in that so it's a box so it's just a box um and so uh let's throw some electrons into it let's throw two electrons into it and so let's call this and so these are the states um these states um the the states the single particle states single particle states of this box are just the, the single particle states of this box are just uh, hydrogenic wave functions. And you know them from last semester. So let's write them down. Um, you know that those wave functions look like this. N, L, M um, of R. <clears throat> you got this radial part, N, L of R. You have this spherical part, spherical harmonic, theta phi. And you did all this last semester, and I'm sure that you remember it all perfectly. <laughs> Just kidding. Um, e sub n is equal to uh, negative z squared over n squared times uh, 13.6 eV. Okay, and that's that's the hydrogenic structure that you derived last semester. Okay, so those are the those are the those are the the wave functions for this box, and so let's look at the first one. The lowest energy one is going to be psi. Can someone tell me what it is? NLM. This is the, uh, just to remind you guys, that's the principal quantum number. And that's the angular momentum. <coughs> and that's the Z component, right, of the angular momentum. And so what's the, what's the NLM for this, for this ground state? Someone tell me, what are those numbers? One zero zero, exactly, and that's what you learned last last time, uh, last semester, right? One zero zero. That's the ground state. That's the ground state of hydrogen. Also, for for any nu nuclear uh, potential, that's the ground state. One zero zero. Okay, good. And so now uh, we're gonna. So so this is helium. So we can ask ourselves, what's the ground state of helium? The ground state. And we know it's going to be a spatial part times a spin part. And, and, uh, and so first we should ask, if I throw two electrons into this, into this uh, box, where do they go? What state? Where do those two electrons go to make the ground state? Where do they go? They got to go somewhere. Where do they go? The spatial ground state to psi one zero zero. Yeah, exactly, because that's the lowest energy. So they both go there. It's just like those other examples we did. That's perfect. They both go there. Uh, and so that means then that the spatial part of the wave function has to be symmetric. So what is the spatial part of the wave function? Can someone tell me? Uh, psi one zero zero of R one times psi one zero zero R two. 
<laughs> yeah. I think it's kind of funny. It's like I'm noticing in Zoom that I see only two students like on my screen. And those are the only two students who are talking, I think. And is that because everyone sees those two students? Is that right? It's uh, Riley and Anasuya. So everyone, everyone is seeing you two, and so, <laughs> so you you have to answer all the questions. <laughs> That's really funny. I wish I could kind of rotate it around so I could like, oh, maybe I can. Let me see if I can. Rotate. I'm gonna hit this little button. Ah, uh, I guess I could change it up, huh? But no one has their pictures on. You guys are the only ones with pictures. Okay. Well, at least at least someone's talking. Um, okay. So I have a. Okay, good. So we have these uh, the symmetric the symmetric spatial part, and then we have we have to multiply by spin part spin part. So what is the uh, spin part of this ground state? It has to be the singlet. State. Exactly, because it's uh because the singlet is um. The, the, the anti-symmetric one. That's exactly right. And so we see that we have the singlet. Uh, and so this then is the ground state of, of helium. Um, and so then uh, what we can do now, what we can do next is we can say, um, what's the excited state wave functions? And so what we can do is for the excited state wave functions, we have all these states. And this is the, the ground state, one, zero, zero. Uh, and this would be, you know, psi two LM, psi three LM. They're highly degenerate states. <coughs> you guys remember that. Um, and so for the excited wave function, we'll put one electron in the, in the lowest one but then the other electron, we can just stick in some random spot here. I'll just, I'll just call that psi n l m. So for the excited wave functions, we'll put one electron into psi one zero zero, and we'll put the other electron into some other higher state n l m where n is greater than one. Okay, so, so that's, that's how we will construct the excited state wave functions of two electrons in helium. But, but now uh, you see that you have, now you see there's something funky because the, the energy, this, the energy of this excited state is really easy. The, the total energy is equal to what? Can someone tell me what the energy of the excited state is? It's just the ground state energy plus the energy of um, whatever excited state the other part. That's exactly right. I'll call it E sub n using this formula, which is right here. That's exactly right. So that's the energy. But 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 I can have a but but now if I have two electrons distributed in these two states, and I ask you, and I can ask you now, uh, what is that total wave function? For, for this for this excited state and once again you can say all right it's a spatial part times a spin part but now you have choices because remember before in the ground state the spatial part when there were two electrons were in the same state i could only construct a symmetric spatial wave function but now the electrons are in the two states and so now my spatial wave function could be plus or minus. And if my spatial wave function is plus, then my spin wave function has to be what? A triplet minus? Exactly. And if the spatial part is minus, then the spin part has to be, oh, I'm sorry, wait. <laughs> I think that was wrong, wait. If my spatial part is plus, then the spin part has to be minus, which is the singlet. I think you might have said triplet. Yeah. Sorry. But, but what but now but if the spatial part is minus then the spin part is what 
symmetric so it's the triplet state exactly exactly so this is the triplet and this is the singlet so we have two choices and so that means that there's going to be sort of two branches of states two types of excited states and one of them uh we call um these ones we call, does somebody know? Does somebody, I mean, you guys have probably read already, maybe most of you have looked in the book already, because I know this is on the homework. But what, do you guys remember what this one is called? The, the singlet, excited states of helium? Does you guys remember? They're called? Parahelium, I think. That's para, exactly. I'm impressed that you remember. I can never remember which one is which. And then the other one is, anybody remember? Is it orthohelium? Exactly, ortho. And so, um, so we can then construct the wave functions quite easily. We can see then that the, the total wave function uh, for, let's do the para. I can construct this, this the, it's a symmetric spatial wave function. So I'll just, well, it's kind of tedious to write out. It's one of the, the spatial wave function is going to be, what is it going to be, psi? One zero zero R one um, psi n l m R two uh, and the symmetric one will be plus and it'll be psi one zero zero of uh, R two and psi n l m of R one and then I got to multiply times the uh, times the uh, the spin and so that's going to be times um, I'll just call it the singlet I'll call it like that. Okay, that's the singlet state. So where that's a S total, M total. But then for ortho, then this, then psi total is equal to uh, all this stuff. But now the plus sign turns into what? Minus. Exactly, it turns into a minus sign, and the sp and the spin part has to be what? What is the spin? I have two electrons. What is the total spin? What is this? What is a symmetric total spin state? Any of the triplet states? Exactly. So I'll just call it one m because it could be any of them. That's right, there's a lot of choices. And so you, you see that, so this is actually kind of interesting because notice that the ortho is magnetic. It has, it has a net moment, it has a net spin, so it's magnetic. That means that if I put it into a magnetic field, it would get deflected and move around and have Zeeman splitting, whereas the, sink, the para is not magnetic. It has no, no spin, so. It's quite, these really, so there's really, these two types of helium have very different properties and, and people study it. I knew a guy who, who studied orthohelium actually. Um, okay, um, and then I could ask one other question. I could say, which is lower in energy? Which is lower in energy, the ortho or the para? I can ask that. Can anyone answer? Which which is lower? So if I have the same two, you know, psi one zero zero psi nlm, you know, the same, you know, if I have the construction from the same two orbitals of helium, but uh, I have or but one is I have one wave function ortho, one wave function para. Which one has lower energy? Now it's a trick question, sort of, because you guys know that the energy is the same, right here, right? It's, it's, it's up here. The energy of the ortho and para should be the same. It's just E1 plus En. They should have the same energy. But they don't <laughs> in real life because what we've neglected in this treatment is electron-electron interactions, right? We neglected that. So now turn on electron-electron interactions and can someone tell me, based on a previous discussion that we've had in this class, which of these two states has lower energy? 
it should be the orthohelium, I think, because the anti-symmetrized spatial wave function means that they'll probably be farther apart on average. Exactly. That's it. Perfect. That's good. So that's exactly right. And that's the right reason. It's the ortho, uh, because the anti-symmetric spatial wave function makes the particles further apart on average. And so their Coulomb repulsion is less. And so the energy is lower. And, and that's another example. And, and I just want you to see that that's magnetic. And so often, uh, when you have many electron systems, often they choose a magnetic state because it lowers the energy. Um, and that's like that's where magnetism comes comes from from the Coulomb interaction. Okay, and 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 the symmetrization of the many body wave function. Take Coulomb interaction plus symmetrization of the many body wave function, and boom, you get magnetism. And here's another example of it right here. Okay, so that's enough of that. I think we've kind of got to beat that into the ground. And so now it's time for a new topic. And the new topic is <coughs> perturbation theory. Perturbation theory. Um, okay, so this is a big topic for this course. And so we're starting it right now. Um, and so we'll start with uh, time independent perturbation theory, which means that we'll just basically ignore time. So we'll talk about systems where the time degree of freedom is not so important. And then we'll discuss time later in the course. So time independent perturbation theory. So, okay, this is a big topic, perturbation theory. And so um, I want to sort of motivate it a little bit. Um, and the thing is, it's like, the whole point of perturbation theory, is, well, the whole point of quantum mechanics is if someone says, you know, here are some particles that interact via some interaction, what are the allowed energies of the system? Because that's what we can measure experimentally. We're good at measuring energies, excited states. We can do that. And so if I, so if I say here's some system of particles or, or, or some particle and some weird potential, what is its allowed energies? Then how do you answer that question? How do you find the allowed energies of a particle or a system of particles that matter? Allowed energies. And that's a really important question because when you do an experiment, that's what you measure are the allowed energies. You know, when you do spectroscopy, spectroscopy, that word means to measure the energy of something. <laughs> that's what spectroscopy is. So, uh, okay, so, uh, Okay, how do, but how do we calculate the, using quantum mechanics, how do we calculate the allowed energies of a quantum mechanical system? What do we do? Solve the Schrodinger equation? Yes, that's what we do. H psi equals E psi. Okay, that's what you do. Um, and when you solve it, then this, uh, this then leads to, um, you get the eigenstates. E sub n, psi sub n. What? Actually, let me use the same notation. I'm using. Okay, and so then you know that h psi sub n is equal to e sub n, psi sub n. Okay, and you solve this equation, and you get them, and those are the eigenstates and the allowed energies. Okay, so that's like the most important thing in quantum mechanics. That. And so if someone says, you know, here's some system, what are the allowed energies, then you've got to solve the Schrodinger equation. And that's the most important thing to do right off the bat to figure out what the heck is going on for that system. But often it turns out it's too hard. Often it's too hard. Now that might come as a surprise to you because last semester, every potential that you encountered, you were able to solve. You did a particle in a box, and you did some harmonic oscillator, and you did Coulomb potential, right? And you were able to solve them. So you're left with this feeling that, you know, it's sort of sometimes it's tedious, but you can do it. You can always solve the shortage equation. But that turns out to be uh, a misrepresentation because in the real world, you really cannot solve the shortage equation that easily. And in fact, last semester, when you solve those three problems, it turns out that those are the only 
three problems <laughs> that anyone can solve, <laughs> and you solved them last semester. And it turns out that there's only one really, there's really only one problem that we can solve in quantum mechanics. Can only solve when you think about it hard. We can only solve one problem in quantum mechanics exactly. And what is that problem? Can someone tell me? What is the only problem that we can really solve in quantum mechanics? The particle in a box? Yeah, that's a, that is a subset, but that's a subset of another problem. Uh, simple, simple harmonic, harmonic oscillator. oscillator? That's right. The simple harmonic oscillator. Jinx, by the way. It turns out that the simple harmonic oscillator, like a particle in a box is just a, a simple harmonic oscillator where the, where the spring constant is zero, right? <laughs> where you, and you have boundaries. And so that's a simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, and it turns out that the Coulomb potential is also a simple harmonic oscillator, but that's not so obvious to see. You have to do a really fancy change of variables that takes pages and pages of algebra, but then you can see it. And so the simple harmonic oscillator is really the only problem we can really solve. Um, and so, but but of course, you know that in the real world, there are many situations where, where this, the, the physical problem we want to solve is not the simple harmonic oscillator. You know that everything in the world is not a simple harmonic oscillator in nature. That happens to be a very common thing, and it's, a, it's, a, it's the only problem we can solve, but it turns out that many objects out there are not simple harmonic oscillators. Can someone give me an example of something that's not a simple harmonic oscillator? Okay, well, look, here's a simple harmonic oscillator. V of x is equal to uh, 1 half kx squared, right? That's a simple harmonic oscillator. And so how do I, uh, how do I make it not a simple harmonic oscillator? I, I add what to it? A damping term? Sure, damping. Well, actually, no, I can do a change of variables. It's still a simple harmonic oscillator because a damping term Oh wait, no, I actually, no, no, I'm sorry, you're right. A damping term is, let's see, what would a damping term be? Yeah, a damping term would be plus gamma x dot. Okay, yeah, that's right. Uh, but that's sort of funky because it has a time dependence and a velocity and the, actually damping is really, really hard to deal with in quantum mechanics. So let's stay away from damping. Can someone give me another, but that was a good comment. The damping turns out to be really hard. Let's, let's stay away from that. Uh, can someone give me another example of, of how to make this uh, no longer simple harmonic oscillator? Well, look, the potential here is x squared. And so if I add another term that goes as x cubed, is, it, is that a simple harmonic oscillator? Yes or no? Is it? Just say yes or no. No. Good. It's not. That's exactly right. It's no longer a simple harmonic oscillator because uh, uh, that's too that's too high. Or or if I could have, because you know that a simple harmonic oscillator is basically a parabola, right? It's like the the potential is a parabola. So as soon as the potential is not a parabola anymore, as soon as I put bump or wiggle in it, then it's no longer a simple harmonic oscillator. And so any any function that's not a parabola is not a simple harmonic oscillator. So you can see that there's many many functions, there's many possible potentials that are not simple harmonic oscillator. And so this we'll call an anharmonic oscillator. Anharmonic oscillator. And this is an important potential, the anharmonic oscillator, like when materials get hot and they jiggle, the, the potentials between them are anharmonic. So this, this physics comes up. Okay, and then there are, there are many other things. So let's just come through and like if I turn on an electric field, or if I turn on a magnetic field, that's not a simple harmonic oscillator. Well, uh, not always. <laughs> Sometimes it is actually, but let's not get too caught up in details. Um, if I have a, a spike, a spike, like a delta spike, like here's a, here's a particle in a box, but now let's put a spike right there in the middle. I'll do a little spike, a delta potential, delta potential. Then that's not a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, I could have, well, I could have, uh, what are some other examples? Uh, I could have spin orbit interactions. 
spin orbit interactions. That's not a simple harmonic oscillator. That's the interaction of uh, orbital angular momentum and spin. Um, and then there, and then uh, another example is the Coulomb interaction. Coulomb. If I have a bunch of particles flying around that can interact by Coulomb, then that's not in, then that's also uh, not a simple harmonic oscillator. Uh, one over uh, r one minus r two uh, for a for a bunch of particles. So so there's many many examples. Uh, and so the question then is, of course, how do we solve them? How do we solve these problems? And this is a very big question um, because, yeah. Professor, I thought you said that the Coulomb potential can be reduced to an SA. Yeah, it's true. If I have a, if I have an electron uh, in a proton, uh, I'm sorry, an electron circling a proton, you can reduce it to a simple harmonic oscillator. Um, but if I have, but if I have an electron that is in, um, but if I have an electron that is in uh, the vicinity of two other charges, then that all goes out the window. You know what I'm saying? Then it, then it goes out the window. Then, then, then I can't do all that. It's only for, you know, one particle and one other particle. But if I have multiple particles, then when I add it all up, it, uh, it, you can no longer do it to, to the best of my knowledge. Um, okay, Got it. so there are many, uh, there are many pr problems that, we're, that we cannot solve that are not simple harmonic oscillators. In fact, most problems in the world uh, are not simple harmonic oscillators and most problems we cannot solve. And so as a result, we use approximation methods in quantum mechanics. And so in this class, we will spend a lot of time talking about approximation methods and in quantum mechanics, this whole idea of using approximation methods is really a big deal. And uh, it's actually more important than in other classes, like in classical mechanics or other, other types of uh, topics. The, you, know, you might think of the approximation method might just be a small part of the topic. But in quantum mechanics, the approximation methods are central. And so um, I just want you to wrap your mind around that because uh, the thing is, like when most people, like people who, well, I would say like people out there who actually use quantum mechanics all the time, uh, like I'm one, you know, I use it all the time. And, and so I'm like the typical person who uses a lot of quantum mechanics all the time. And, and when I think, and when people who use quantum mechanics a lot, think about quantum mechanics, they typically, they often think about it in terms of physicists, think about it in terms of perturbation theory. So perturbation theory, uh, provides a new framework for thinking about quantum mechanics. You already have a framework in your mind for how you think about quantum mechanics, and that framework is H, you know, the Schrodinger equation. But perturbation, perturbation theory provides you with a new framework to think about how to solve problems in quantum mechanics, and it's a new way of thinking. And so I just, I just want to warn you that at the beginning. So the concepts that we discuss are not just math tricks you know often perturbation uh, often approximation methods are just math tricks you know but uh, but these perturbation theory that we're about to learn it is a bunch of math tricks yes it is math tricks but it's more it, it the perturbation theory provides a new conceptual framework and so i'm going to try i want to give you a sense of what that new framework is if you don't have it yet unless you taken you know this class before but i'm just saying you know it's it's not something you're born with and it's not obvious the perturbation theory framework is not obvious you know someone has to teach it to you you know some smart people came up with it and but it's very useful and it's and it's how we solve problems in quantum mechanics so that said you know you should now be curious what is this new conceptual framework so let's dive into that what is it um so first i'll just say it's perturbation theory is the approximation method that we're going to discuss first. And um, so what is it? Okay, so <laughs> perturbation theory. Perturbation theory is, is, is useful. It does, first, I'll say it does not always work, but, per, but often it works. And it works often enough that, you know, we learn it in undergrad class, classrooms. 
<clears throat> anything that we learn in an undergrad classroom is, is useful because otherwise we wouldn't bother teaching it to you guys. So, so perturbation theory is useful <clears throat> when we can write <clears throat> a Hamiltonian <clears throat> as <clears throat> a Hamiltonian that we know <clears throat> plus a Hamiltonian that we don't know. So this is the one that we know. And this is a and this one is the one we don't know, and that one is a small perturbation. So uh, Professor, yeah. I think your video is frozen. Like your iPad. Um, I don't we don't see anything. Hmm. That's really weird. All right. Maybe I'll I'll stop the mirroring and then make it. Maybe I'll stop the mirroring and then do it again. See if it comes back. <clears throat> yeah, I think it's back. Okay. Yay. All right. So uh, okay. So <clears throat> perturbation theory is useful, <clears throat> and when we have a Hamiltonian that we know H naught, and then when we have, and then we have the hard one. So the H prime, <clears throat> that's the one we don't know. That's like the anharmonic perturbation. That's the relativity, relativistic correction, the spin orbit interaction. That's the weird part we don't know. And, and, and so if that weird part is little compared to a part we do know, then we use perturbation theory. And that's the situation where perturbation theory is useful. Um, and so, uh, so the idea then is, is if we so the idea is that h naught is the problem that we know and so that means that we have already solved this okay so this is the problem so this is and so this is the one that's known so the idea is that this is some problem that you solved last semester like particle in a box hydrogen atom simple harmonic oscillator um free particle that's another free particle uh, so those are kind of basically all the, all the ones that you solved last semester. So, so let's just assume that H naught is one of those Hamiltonians that you know, but H prime is the one that you don't know. <clears throat> so, so this is how you should think about it in your mind. Um, you should think what what you do is is you you think I have I have my my unperturbed Hamiltonian and this one we'll call the um, so this is what you have in your mind we have the um, we have the uh, H naught which is the unperturbed Hamiltonian unperturbed Hamiltonian let's just say unperturbed <clears throat> and that <clears throat> and that gives me a bunch of states which are um, Um, where I have uh, psi one, um, and the notation I'm going to use is I'm going to put a little zero here. Now that that little zero here means that it's the unperturbed state, unperturbed state. So that's the first unperturbed eigenstate. Then we have the second, and then we have the third, etc. So there's a whole ladder of states, right? Um, I mean, you know, there's just the different eigenstates <clears throat> and they all have different energies. They're quantized because <clears throat> quantum mechanics. Um, okay, so we have those different states. And now over here, we have the perturbed Hamiltonian, perturbed. And this is H naught plus H prime, okay? And so this also has some set of states, psi one. Uh, psi two, <clears throat> psi three, psi four, and so this is what we this is what we don't know, and this is what we do know, and so some and so somehow what what happens is that there's there's a way the the way you should think in your mind is that this state morphs into this state 
And the way to think about it is I can write, this is the way to think about it. I can write H is equal to H naught plus lambda of times H prime, where this is just some variable. This is just some variable. And <clears throat> if I go from here, from the left to the right, then lambda here, lambda equals zero, and here, lambda equals one. And so here, lambda equals is going from zero to one. Okay, so you can see how if I can write, I can, if, if h prime is some small perturbation, then I can write h equals h naught plus lambda. And if, if lambda equals one, then I have h equals h naught plus h prime. <clears throat> so the way I want you to think about it in your mind is when lambda is zero, the perturbation is off. Perturbation is off. But when lambda equals one, the perturbation is on, fully on. But we don't just turn it fully on, we ramp it up slowly. So in your mind, think of the perturbation as starting from nothing and then slowly ramping up to the full perturbation. And even the full perturbation is still pretty small, but lambda ramps up the perturbation. Okay, so we, we parametrize the Hamiltonian. So it's sort of like we, we make up a, sort of a fake Hamiltonian, H naught plus lambda H prime. And so that's like a made up Hamiltonian. But the idea is that we're then going to turn lambda to one. And when lambda goes to one, then we have that, the Hamiltonian that we actually care about, because that's the one we care about. You know, the perturbed Hamiltonian is what we want to know. That's the one we want to understand. The perturbed Hamiltonian is the one we care about. <clears throat> so the idea in your mind is that as lambda, as I ramp up the, the perturbation, then psi one goes, psi one naught goes to psi one, Psi, psi two naught goes to psi two, psi three naught goes to psi three, psi four naught goes to psi four. As I go from here, from lambda equals zero to lambda equals one. So as I, and, and similarly, I should say that I have the energies, E one naught, E two naught, E three naught, E four naught. So, not only do the wave functions change, but the energies also change. <clears throat> These are the perturbed energies, E1, E2, E3, E4. Those are the things that we want to know. And so, and so not, only do the, not only do the wave functions change, but the energies too, because I have E1 naught, E1, E2 naught, E3 naught, and then here I have E1, E2, E3. <clears throat> in your mind, you should think that the, that the energies morph into the new energies as lambda goes to one, all right? So for lambda equals zero, I have the old energies, the, the unperturbed, but as lambda goes to one, I have the new energies. And so that's the picture, and you have to have that picture in your head. And so everything just, and the word we like to use is adiabatic. Everything just adiabatically morphs. Adiabatic, adiabatic morphing. We, the, the thing morphs adiabatically from one system to the other. So we go from H naught to H naught plus H prime, and it's an adiabatic tra transformation. <clears throat> uh, adiabatic just means slowly, all right? Just, 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 that just means slow. And continuous, slow, continuous. Um, okay, and and that's it. You know, that's the most important concept for perturbation theory. Because once you have that concept, um, then everything kind of follows. And I just want to say that that this does not always work. Sometimes when you change the Hamiltonian, things do not slowly and adiabatically morph. An example would be a phase transition, like going from, a, say, a metal to a superconductor, or from uh, an insulator to a metal. These are phase transitions. Sometimes when you slowly tweak a Hamiltonian, 
the system will suddenly change dramatically such that you cannot do this. So in those situations, you cannot do perturbation theory. Perturbation theory cannot solve superconductivity. People took 50 years to solve superconductivity. Why did it take 50 years, 50 years to solve the problem of superconductivity? The reason is because it did not lend itself to perturbation theory. Perturbation theory did not work. Various people tried perturbation theory and it, uh, it, did, it did not work. <clears throat> uh, but, but for many problems, it does work. And that's why we learned it uh, in our undergraduate quantum mechanics. Okay, so, so now, so, so this is the picture in your mind. So now you see that we have H, the Hamiltonian. The Hamiltonian now can be written as a Hamiltonian but that we know plus the perturbation that we don't know, H prime. What that means then is that H, the Hamiltonian, can be thought of as some function of this variable lambda, <coughs> which, <coughs> which <coughs> we're going to tune from zero to one. But right now, let's just think of lambda as just a variable. All right, and so that, but that means then that the, the wave functions that, that we want psi, these eigenstates are also wave functions, are also functions of lambda. And the energy, the eigenenergies are also functions of lambda. So we see that all of these things are functions of this variable lambda okay and i think that's okay so so i think you can picture that in your mind <clears throat> so what that means then if those things are functions of lambda then that means that i should be able to write so if h is equal to uh, h naught plus lambda and if these eigenstates and eigenenergies are also functions of lambda i should be able to write them as a um as as a, uh, a as a series as a power series i should be able to write them as a power series um of lambda so let's write them as a power series power series um and so that means then that i should be able to write um psi the thing that i want re remember what we want is this Let's not, let's keep our eye on the prize. We want to solve this problem. H psi n is equal to E n psi n. And these are the things we don't know. We, we're like, what is he? We don't know him. What is he? But we, but what we already know is this. H not psi n not is equal to E n not psi n not. So this is what we know. Okay, so this is what we want, and this is what we know. So the thing we want, then, I can write the thing that we want is a function of lambda. It is equal to the thing we know, psi n naught, because it started out as psi n naught, right? It, it started there when lambda is zero. But then, that's what we have when lambda equals zero. But then as I slowly turn on lambda, then I have a, a series, a power series of terms. <clears throat> and so I can write this as a function of this. I, I have, my, um, I, I have my, my first order term, lambda times the first order term, psi n1. That's the first order correction. Then plus lambda squared times the second order correction plus lambda cubed blah 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 <laughs> we never we, we won't go past two <laughs> but some people do so this is uh the third order correction well let me actually maybe i'll just write it uh i'll write it uh plus lambda q psi n3 plus dot 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 and then and then we can write the eigenenergies the things that we want that's the thing we want. We can write it as the thing that we know, the starting one, <clears throat> plus all the higher order corrections. The first order correction, E one n plus lambda squared times E two n plus lambda cubed times uh, E 
3 n plus dot 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 dot. So I want you to see what I'm doing. This this is mathematically sound. This is okay. I'm just writing these unknown things as power series in this variable, and they and they are. I can write them as a power series because because these power you know the polynomial is a complete set of states so i, I can do that <clears throat> okay and so this is what we call the perturbation expansion perturbation expansion and so so once we do that then everything else becomes pretty straightforward so that was the, so this is the hardest part conceptually it's the hardest part because once you've done that power that expansion, then we can just say, okay, if you if you buy, if you buy into that, if you if, if you're okay with that, then then now all we got to do is now let's just solve h psi equals e psi. Let's just solve the Schrodinger equation now using the perturbation expansion. Using the expansion. Okay, that's what we're going to do right now. <clears throat> so let's just plug it in. Um, and so what we do then is we say h is h naught plus lambda h prime. Okay, that's h. And then we have uh, psi n is is uh, is psi n naught plus lambda psi n1 plus lambda squared psi n2 plus dot 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 is equal to and so this is so that's my eigenstate is equal to e n my eigen energy which is e n not plus e n1 plus e n. oh i'm sorry i gotta get those lambdas in there damn it Lambda squared e n two dot 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 times now again the eigenstate psi n naught plus lambda psi n one plus lambda squared psi n two plus dot dot dot. <coughs> okay, so that's the Schrodinger equation using this perturbation expansion. And now I just multiply it all out. Just now, just grind through it. And but let's not do it mindlessly. Let's let's multiply out. Um, multiply out. Um, and and collect terms. Multiply out. Plus, collect terms. Uh, let's collect uh, like powers of lambda. So we're going to multiply this out, <clears throat> but what we're going to do is we're going to pull all, all the lambda zero terms onto one side. Basically, we're going to do this. We're going to collect all the, the lambda to the zero terms in here, plus all the lambda one terms in here, Let's solve the lambda two terms in here, and we're going to say equals zero. So we're going to put the, everything onto one side and collect all the like terms of lambda. So let's do that. And and I'm not going to go through the algebra. You guys go home and do it. You know, go through the algebra. It's really simple. It's simple. No tricks. It's simple, but it's tedious. It is tedious. Um, so but let's do it because it's it's important to do tedious things because if the answer is so important, it's worth it. So let's so when you when you multiply that out and collect like terms of lambda, you find that you get h naught minus e n naught times psi n naught uh, times lambda naught plus so that's the zeroth order term. I'll call that you know zeroth order term, and then I got that second order term, which is going to be h naught minus e n naught uh, times psi n one <coughs> plus h one h prime uh, minus e n one times psi n naught 
to the lambda to the first order plus, and then the second order term is going to be uh, H naught minus EN naught times psi N2. There is actually a little pattern to it. I don't know if you can see the pattern. It's like the exponents add up to the power of lambda. Oh, I didn't write. Oh, yeah. Uh, plus H prime minus En1 psi N1 plus En2 psi N0 times lambda squared plus dot 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 equals zero. Okay, that's it. We did it. And so now what we do is we, we're going to do a trick because this is true. We're going to do the same trick that you do. It's, it's the same trick that you do for separation of variables. You've done this trick before. We say that this is true. This equation is true for any value of lambda. But how could it be true for any value of lambda? The only way it could be true for any value of lambda is if the coefficients of all of the polynomial in lambda, the coefficients must equal what? Someone tell me. Zero. Right, exactly. Because I have, exactly, you've, and you've done this trick before. All these coefficients are zero. They got to equal zero. <clears throat> and so then what we can do then is I can then set these three coefficients equal to zero, and that gives me three equations. And I will write down those three equations, and then we'll be done for today. Let me just write them down, though. So this gives us three equations. The first one I'll call the zero order equation is this one. Um, H naught psi n naught. That's what we get from the first one. And this is the one that we already knew, en naught psi n naught. Well, that's good. That makes sense. But that's kind of boring. We already knew that. Then we get the first order equation is the next one that's we get by setting you know this one equal to zero and so that that will give us this it'll give us a h naught psi n1 plus h prime psi n naught is equal to e n naught psi n1 and this is really easy to get it's just a bunch of algebra but you can get it E and one psi and not. Uh, that's the first order. And then the last one I'll write is a second order equation. The third term is this. It'll be uh, H not psi and two plus H prime psi and one equals E and not psi and two plus E N one psi N one plus E N two psi N naught. Okay, so those are the three uh, equations. And basically what we have to do is we have to solve them. And that, when we solve them, is what we call perturbation theory. So perturbation theory simply means solving these three equations. And so that's what we'll do next time. We'll solve those three equations. Bye. Bye-bye. Meet again. <clears throat>